We're here with Steve Hughes, who is uh, with the Working Families Party here in Oregon. Uh, do you have a title, or are you just with them? Uh, state director. State director. Like that. that was it. Yeah, I forgot to ask you that. So, uh, state director. This it's a it's a Oregon Working Families Party. This is just a a, a party that is in Oregon. I take it then. Uh, well, the Working Families Party is actually in several states, um, and I think six now, and looking to co continue to expand to other states. But it was uh, founded in 1998, actually, in New York really? State. And mm -hmm. now it's um, it spread to uh, Oregon in 2006, and we uh, continue to keep growing. Right, and from what I understand, uh, at least part of the dynamic is that you're not necessarily going to, you don't run candidates, but you... You uh, support specific candidates that are running for whatever party happens to be, whatever that person happens to be doing what you, you think is important. Well, it's you not might that be able to say that a lot different way. Right. Than it's I it's not that we don't run candidates. It's that we, as a minor political party, retain uh, a longer list of options that we um, can use to enact political change on behalf of uh, you know, building power for working people. Um, we founded here in Oregon, like I said, a few years back, but one of the first things we did was we worked to change the election law in the state. So um, we, after three years of trying in the Oregon State Legislature, we finally passed uh, a law that uh, sets up something called fusion voting, which is now in effect here in the state of Oregon, which essentially means that um, a candidate who is running for office on one of the major parties can also be cross-nominated by minor parties. That's what it was. Okay. Oh, right. I remember. Right. Yeah. So, you, from what I understand, that used to be the way it was, and then it was changed, and then you're bringing it back. Right. State by it state. It used to be the law of the land in almost every state. Um, it was used, uh, we oftentimes say it was a, a, a victim of its own success, in that it was being used very effectively during the populist movement ah, of okay. a previous age, to uh, build power between the urban working class and the rural working class that oftentimes were being kept divided from one another through the use of the ingenious use of uh, the social issues of the day, which at that time was the issue of temperance or whether or not alcohol should be legal. Mm -hmm. And that issue was being used to split uh, urban uh, Catholic uh, working class people from uh, rural Protestant, Protestant. Uh, uh, working class people that were oftentimes involved in the populist movements and the urban folks were involved in the labor movements. Fusion voting allowed those two to constituencies yeah. to find candidates they could agree on, cross-nominate them, both put their seal of approval on the same candidates that shared a common economic interest between the two groups. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, build power between those two groups that were previously being divided. It was being used so effectively, like I said, that um, the powers that be found a way to systematically dismantle this voting system state by state around the country until the point where it existed in only a few states, New York being the one that still, one of the ones that still had it, which is why the Working Families Party started there. But now, as we build momentum, we look to change the laws in different states and um, mm -hmm. win back this right to have more choice in our voting procedures. Right. You mentioned labor. So has, has the states that are under the gun, like with uh, the, the governors in, in Ohio and uh, Wisconsin, either one of them states have this? Uh, I, no. They do not have this yet, uh, or again. Um, so those are states that are not yet uh, fusion states. Um, hopefully someday. I mean, obviously people are on the move there and uh, places that we need to be building the, the resistance. Mm -hmm. Well, it just seems to me that labor is such a big thing, especially since the one, the, the, uh, the law that uh, the governor Kashich or something like that recently passed mm -hmm. uh, that was attacking lab laborers' rights to, to uh, uh, work together. It was two to one, I think, the people shot that law down. Yeah, no, it was very resounding. I mean, so labor is powerful there. Then. I wonder if you could give us an example of, uh, for example, our, I don't know if you can compare it, but our mayor is not running because he doesn't want to spend the time and energy. Is, is that <coughs> also part of what you're talking here? That when you, fusion to me means going together mm -hmm. with 
what letting someone run at the same time they're doing something else or no what it means so say uh, you were running for office okay and you did, you were you know on the, one of the major party tickets say you were running as a Democrat for state legislature okay okay and you wanted to also receive the nomination of the working families party you would come to the working families party seeking yeah. our party's nomination and we would follow An our process at nomination okay. so it's different okay. it's a nomination because we are an independent political party okay that has okay. access to the ballot so we could run Oh, our own candidate oh, in races, right. which is traditionally, in, our, in modern memory, the role that minor parties have played. Okay. Um, you know, the, the spoiler, the quote-unquote spoiler. Oh, okay. You know, right. you run that third-party candidate, and you're going to throw the race to the other guy. That's, that's the, right. Okay. That's the, always the fear. That's always the thing that's thrown in the face of minor parties to marginalize them right off the right. bat. And this is a way to get Fusion takes that. that off the table. It doesn't mean that we don't retain the right to run our own candidates. Okay. But we retain the right also to nominate candidates from other parties that we see as fighting the good fight. We all know there are uh, corporate politicians and politicians that are out there you know, fighting for working people. But a lot of times they all have the same party label. So when a candidate seeks the Working Families Party nomination, we hold them to a higher standard. And when their name appears on the ballot, as, say, you appear on the ballot with, as a Democrat, comma, Working Families Party, okay. voters see, oh, this candidate, but not this candidate, got the nomination of the Working Families Party. I know what that means. That means that they're fighting for good jobs, good schools, health care. They're fighting for the state bank. They're fighting for the things that I've heard about and I care about. Okay. Um, and I'm going to vote for them. So it's a way of putting our mark... Uh, on the ballot and communicating literally with every voter in the state because that's the last thing that every voter right. sees is that ballot. So the information yeah. that's on there is very important. Well, you, what it is to me is that you not only have the constituency of the Democrats, but you have the constituency represented by the Working Families Party. Absolutely. And it isn't just set up. The fusion voting isn't just set up for the Working Families Party. They could also have a comma Labor Party or sure. comma Socialist sure. Party as well. It, it opens the door for more parties to participate in more ways, mm -hmm. um, which to me, uh, the times when working people have been the strongest have also corresponded with the times there's been the most democracy in our society. To me, this is a reform for democracy, little d, um, as well as an opportunity for working people to organize in new ways and exert leverage over the electoral system that oftentimes we get shut out of because we're told there's no alternative, or if you vote for the, uh, the other parties, you're going to throw it to the even worse guy, the, the, the classic, the lesser of two evils mm -hmm. argument. We're, we reject that, and we have found ways under the fusion voting law to work around that um, and to you know, be strategic, but at the end of the day, stand up for mm -hmm. working people in the electoral process. And that's if there's a candidate with either a D or an R after their name, or whatever it's after their name, mm -hmm. that that you can live with, basically. That 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 represents or symbolizes a fair amount of your of your platform. I mean, I think I think nobody's going to be a hundred percent. Sure, nobody platform. is. But what I've found in this work is that there are people in both of the major parties that are fed up with the way the major parties uh, represent them. And there are working people in both parties that have a lot of concerns about, you know, putting food on the table, paying their rent, paying their mortgage. And nobody's talking about those issues in a real way in the wow. current state of our debate and a lot of the time. And so what we're trying to do with our cross-nomination is to inject those issues into the election. If a candidate wants our nomination, if they want okay. that to appear on the ballot, they have to come to us and talk about those issues with us and bring those issues up in the election in order to meet that higher standard. So you can look on that person favorably. Right. With the, you support each other. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that. So your nomination of of uh, of a particular candidate in order to get that, they have to address vocally some of the things that you your, your party wants to so if it's labor or if it's 
uh, free trade or for whatever it is, it's not something that they can't just believe that. They actually have to talk about it and inject that into the campaign. Right. I think I think it's a very important part. Yeah, of this. yeah. I mean, I I think the the best example of this in the recent okay. time is the issue of the Oregon State Bank. Um, this was an issue that we've now been talking about for several years. I mean, in the immediate wake of the financial crisis, there was a large town hall meeting. About 800 people here in Portland got together to start talking about what can we do. It was brought like together by Jobs three with Justice. Years now, I think. Three years, yeah. yeah. Um, people started talking about, you know, what can we do to build an economy that works for us? Because the one we just witnessed come crashing down around our head and ears was not working for us. And one of the ideas that had bubbled up from that conversation was the idea of modeling a state-based institution like what they have in the state of North Dakota. Because right now, our state takes literally billions of our tax dollars, billions with a B, that they take in in tax dollars and deposit that money into the very same Wall Street banks that crashed our economy. And we believe that there's a very simple <laughs> solution to this. We need to find a way to bring this money home. Uh, people are talking about moving their money individually. It's become a very powerful movement in the last just literally a couple weeks. And we believe that we also need to be extending that conversation to institutional deposit mm. holders like the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about this issue. You know, at the end of the day, we have to get legislation passed to institute this. And the way we do that is we go to people running for office at the time we say when they're the most likely to listen to us, which is when they want something they from want us, something. Right? <laughs> our vote, our support, mm -hmm. and we bring them issues and say, look, if you want our support, here are the issues we want you to take on. You need to talk about this. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the last legislative session, every candidate that supported uh, vote actively the state bank yeah. as a piece of legislation was a Working Families Party nominee. The very first bill introduced for a state bank, in fact, the very best one, was introduced by Bob Jensen, a Republican, Republican. out of Pendleton. Yeah. Oh. He was a cross nominee of the Working Families Party. Oh. The other people who supported it, who were sponsors of the bill, were Phil Barnhart, a Democrat out of Eugene, and a cross nominee of the Working Families Party. And uh, Chip Shields out of Portland, oh, yeah. He's a cr cross nominee yeah. of the Working Families Party. And, of course, uh, the treasurer, Ted Wheeler, was a huge oh. ally and advocate for this uh, piece of legislation. And oh. he was also a cross nominee being of the Working Families Party. Being a treasurer, it should have some weight, too. Absolutely. So that's, I think, the example of how it works. It's taking those issues that we're talking about at the grassroots, in the Occupy movement, in the 99% movement, in all of these places, and finding ways to translate them into getting politicians talking about them. Mm -hmm. That's the role that we try to play in the movement as the Working Families Party, is to make that transition from feet in the streets, which is incredibly important, to people talking about it in the halls of power, too, and pressuring those people in the halls of power to do right by working people. Mm -hmm. uh, Oregon does have state banks, right? No. There's only one state uh, in the country that has one, which is North Dakota right now. There's, really? there's several states, about a dozen, that have been considering legislation in some way or another um, to uh, create a state bank. I think where the confusion might come is that Oregon actually got really far down the process. In the last legislative session, our bill moved from the beginning of the session to the end through two committees um, oh, okay. in both the House and the Senate, so it advanced out of their committees, which most bills don't even do. It did so with bipartisan support. Um, it passed out of its uh, Senate committee on a 5-1 to one vote mm -hmm. and out of the House committee on an 8-0 to zero vote. Um, so, you know, Democrats oh, and Republicans wow. voted for this thing. Yeah. yeah. Anytime you can get it. Yeah. In this political yeah. climate, when you get something that both Democrats and Republicans can get behind, um, that's pretty amazing given what's going on mm -hmm. in the general atmosphere out there. Um, it just got stalled at the end of the session and kind of the last minute horse wrangling that goes on in the session. But 
Um, I fully expect they'll bring something back. But I think it comes back to your question about, you know, this is an example of how we move an issue through the legislature. Okay, but uh, state banks can't get FDIC, is that right? Well, there's there's different, uh, you're going to... Uh, if there was one. If there was one. So the only example that exists is the Bank of North Dakota, which is not oh, a carbon oh. copy of what we were proposing here in the state of Oregon. Okay. Um, they're not FDIC insured. They are self-insured by the state of North Dakota. So they are they back their yeah. own. I think uh, when you start to get into the details of the Bank of North Dakota versus what's proposed in Oregon, there are plenty of differences. Okay. What we tried to do, though, was find the things that are the most salient about what's working in North Dakota, which are a couple things. One is... Um, their programs that they have to stimulate lending into small businesses and family farms. Yeah. So they have a Good. mechanism in place in the Bank of North Dakota called participation lending that allows for the state bank to work in partnership with the community banks around the state to make loans available that wouldn't otherwise be able to get made by the community banks themselves mm -hmm. to small businesses and family farms. And as you say, they have millions, billions of dollars that comes through the tax revenues and all the various revenues of the state right. that are deposited in that state bank. And they have those in order the, to those are the, That's the money the they have to work with yeah. as compared to what we have right now in Oregon, which is we deposit it into the big banks. And that money goes immediately out of state. Um, the, the, the interest on that money is collected by uh, out-of-state interests, um, and the money is not making its way back into our communities in form of loans and credit to these small businesses and family farms. So it was really important to us that's a, to... That's a problem. Yeah. I know. I wish we had more than just one state, North Dakota, to uh, as a model for this. But how did they do during this meltdown that's been going on for a couple, three years now? Well, uh, did, it, did it put them in better in better standing? Yeah, North Dakota is doing very well for themselves. I mean, they have I think about four percent. Don't quote me on that, but uh, four percent. Don't quote me. I'm on television. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, they have about four percent unemployment. Um, wow. I think it's uh, you can't attribute all of that to the state bank by any means. They're experiencing a natural resource boom. There's oil right. that they've recently right. discovered in North Dakota. So um, that's obviously driving a lot of it. But I think you can look at um, other factors and extrapolate from that, that in fact, having a state bank has been a net positive to the North Dakota economy. Number one, um, Oregon has had something like six or seven banks fail since the economic crisis. And to put that in perspective, we only have about now 30 community banks in the state. And when they fail, it allows a larger bank like Chase taking over Wild. Yeah, fail doesn't mean they in. go away. It means they get bought up by a bigger bank by a bigger and bank, they yeah. build their empire a little bigger. Right. So we've had those bank failures. By contrast, North Dakota has not had a single bank failure. Mm. Okay. And they will, they will state this flat out, that the reason for that is because the Bank of North Dakota, when the crisis hit, was able to proactively work with their community banks, which are essentially the lifeline to a lot of rural communities, especially in North Dakota, for credit for the businesses and the farms. They were able to work with those banks to make sure that they were properly you know, isolated or insulated from the external shock going on in the, the, mm -hmm. literally the global economy. So that's been a huge factor. I think the other thing that the Bank of North Dakota has done for the state of North Dakota is that it is a revenue generator for the state. It, oh, oh, yeah, now. It's it, got all that energy. It, it is a profit center for the state of North Dakota. Um, the money they bring in, um, they then lend out, and they're the ones collecting that interest, not Bank of America, not Wells Fargo. Uh, Chase. And, Chase and, and the like. The state is benefiting from its own money, and that money gets returned back to the citizens of the state mm -hmm. in the form of you know, money coming back to the state government to fund critical services. So there is definitely 
uh, tangible benefits, but I'm, I'm always hesitant to say it's simply because of the Bank of North Dakota that right. the unemployment rate in North Dakota it's is so low. It's more complicated well. dynamic it's, yes. than that. But, you know, it, 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 it's what has been going on for some time, you know, since the free trade movement and, and the people can buy something that's made across the world cheaper than they can buy it here. Uh, there's been a move to, to uh, buy more local. And it seems to me this kind of fits into that paradigm where, right. where you not only buy local, but you invest local. Right. And then think that I think that, that that fits into that very well. Right. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, we're a state uh, that prides itself on, like you said, buying local, shopping local, eating local. And I think now with the emergence of this Move Your Money campaign kind of really permeating at the grassroots, People are talking about banking local as sort of the next phase of that. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to be talking about the local, you know, individual, what you can do with your personal money, um, which is why, you know, we, as part of this bank transfer day, really started to do some campaigning around which banks and credit unions are truly local in the state so people can have that information. Mm -hmm. I think the individual deposit moving is important, and I also think we have to be talking about institutional players. Um, we're talking city government, county government, oh, and our oh. state government, which are huge depositors into these big banks a lot of the time. Mm. Those entities need to also start talking about ways to bring that money back home and, and <coughs> localizing it so that it can benefit our communities. Okay, well, I didn't think about that. So not only would the, uh, the state of Oregon put the money in, in the Oregon State Bank, but would, would the cities do that as well? Not necessarily. I mean, I think but some... They could? Some, yeah, they could. I think, I mean, again, this legislation is now, you know, the session's over. So what comes forward in the next session will be still to be determined. Um, but, you know, some cities have already very close relationships with community banks in there. So it's not right. to, you know, circumvent that or divert that, but it could be a, a conduit for that to happen. Um, I mean, we are focusing mainly on the state, but I just, uh, what I'm saying more generally is that I think the next phase of the Move Your Money movement, which is really becoming a powerful force to be reckoned with, I mean, there was like... 600,000 people who transferred their accounts <coughs> to local banks and credit unions. Is that local or? Couldn't, couldn't be local. That was, many. that was many. No, na 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 nationally. Na <coughs> Somebody mentioned earlier it was $100 million. Worth. It's a lot. I, 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 On one day. What? Could very well be. I don't know. Wow. I didn't see those statistics. Yeah. But, I mean, this is just the power of individuals moving their money to lot. more local institutions. Imagine what we could do if we also joined together and called on our institutions that represent us, our, our state government, for example, mm -hmm. to also move its money to an option that takes the money and brings it back home and invests it locally. Uh, sure. What's, what's community bank? Is that anything like state? That, I mean, obviously it isn't state because that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Community banks, they're not federal savings and loan. Uh, well, there's, so one of the things we found during this state bank campaign uh -huh. is that um, the terms that get used to describe these things right. aren't very well defined. Okay. Um, they kind of move around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the definition of community bank is, according to some people, you know, much bigger than you would ever imagine it to be. Um, so we decided that actually one of the things that we needed to do was to research all of the community banks and all of the credit unions in the state to find out which ones were truly local banks and credit unions and which ones were were not. Uh, which ones, because oh. every community bank, every credit union, no matter where you go, is trying to look local. They're all trying to, they all have marketing campaigns it, it trying to that, look like the local that, option. That face on, yeah. And what we decided we needed to do was to cut through the marketing campaigns and look at the facts that determine whether a bank is truly local. So we, we did that research oh. as a part of the state bank campaign wow. and found that, uh, in fact, uh, there are plenty of local options in the state. There are, like I said, I think 140 uh, banks and credit unions doing business in the state, and many of them uh, score very high on our local scale. Mm -hmm. um, we ranked them, we gave them scores, and we measured those on uh, 
uh, and we posted that actually we created a website for it um, but what we did was we measured them on where their headquarters was which is one factor you know are they headquartered in the state of Oregon but we also measured uh, what their ownership structure is because a bank can be headquartered in the state but be owned by out-of-state institutional and absentee investors mm -hmm. so ownership matters we also measured the number of branches out of their total number of branches are that are in the state of Oregon what percentage of their total footprint is in Oregon versus in other states or nationwide as a measure of how local they were sure you know uh, like like a uh, chase they just recently bought out Wamu but most of their stuff's on the East Coast. Right. So, so Chase would not necessarily fit very well. You know, most of their branches are not in the state of Oregon for that reason. Um, and we also looked at the lending practices, how these banks and credit unions invest back into the community yeah. via making yeah. loans to small businesses and family farms. So we rated all of the institutions in Oregon um, based on those factors and gave them each a local score and have now made it available on uh, on our website or on Oregon Bank's local. That was just up there a few minutes or, ago. Let's yeah. get that oh, back up there. Okay. Um, it's Oregon Banks with an S, local? Banks local. Okay, I got that right then. There you go. Is that right? right? And, and Oregon the, Banks local. Okay. And the idea with that is you can look up you know, your current bank or credit union. Okay. You could also look up a bank or credit union your thinking of moving your money to, to see how they yeah. rate based on these measures. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to compare against one another and to cut through the marketing and go to the facts of what's truly local and what's not. Sure. Again, I think all of that's part of this individual move your money effort. But longer term, we also have to be talking about this institutional approach of moving our money uh, with the institutions that represent us, so that's mm -hmm. where we're heading next. Right, and and uh, that the Oregon Bank's local is one. There's also a, a Facebook page, Bank Transfer Day, and that was just a little side thing, but I want to just mention that briefly. Uh, the corporate media has been talking about this big bank transfer day last Saturday, and they, they talk about it was started by this one woman who was fed up with these $5 fees or whatever, and there's no doubt that people are fed up with these fees, oh, yeah. but People were talking about, at least in this town, three years ago, I, I videotaped rallies downtown where people were saying, move your money to community banks three years ago. It was because of the meltdown. It was because of the, the gross negligence and greed of, of the banking industry. And uh, it's funny how it caught on when people were being nickel and dimed, five bucks here, five bucks there. But but this thing goes goes beyond what what uh, the people have been hearing about. I think on the corporate news that it, it's because people were upset because they were getting hit for a what was it? Uh, uh, Bank of America had a five dollar fee or something that just yeah, pissed yeah. everybody off, yeah. and yeah, they had to bank they had to bank off, back off. Right. But well, what you were saying this this thing that you this meeting you went to three years ago this has been in the works for a lot longer than sure. Just, I mean. Uh, social movements build for a long time, and then there are events that spark. Uh, right. You know, Occupy sparked that. This five-dollar fee sparked this thing specific to the banks. I think the focus on the fee, um, in many ways, does a disservice to the broader issue at play. That's kind um, of what I was getting at. Yeah, know? I think the the, foot. the fee. Is sort of you know yeah that's the thing that caught a lot of people's attention, but the thing that should keep us awake at night is the fact that when you look at where our money is held in the state of Oregon, 66 percent, two thirds of all private deposits are held by just five Wall Street banks. Hmm. Okay. What banks are those? Um, the big ones. I, I don't don't B ask me. Listen, you, you, you know them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and any of you out there uh, putting your money in those banks, think about it. <laughs> so when two thirds of our collective wealth are held by just five mega institutions in just the state of Oregon, what that means is we don't control our money. We don't control our economy. We don't have the tools in place to build a sustainable local economy that's resilient against uh, external financial shocks. We are very much 
uh, at the whims of uh, Wall Street still when our money is controlled in such large numbers. So I think the issue of the fee was a catalyzing moment, but it's not the end game here. Mm-hmm. The end game is looking at where our money is on institutional sure. big picture, and we have to change that number of 66%, or we have no hope of building a local economy. I, I, I do want to make a, a comment about to do with Bank of America. So when this all this stuff went bad, and they were the, giving money to the banks and all that, Bank of America was forced by the federal government to, this is my understanding, to take over countrywide and all their toxic assets. And ever since then, they have been looking harder than ever for ways to make up for dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where this, probably where this $5 came from. So we've got to find some way to deal with this countrywide situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very unfair of the federal government to to make, force them to take this over. So I just want to make that comment on mm. for the benefit of Bank of America. I, 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 uh, I've also heard that, uh, I guess it was last year, <clears throat> they got all that bailed out money and they didn't pay, any, and they showed an enormous profit and didn't pay any taxes on that. Mm. So okay, it, it okay. goes back and forth. But what you're saying about that 60%, you know, that's well mm-hmm. taken uh, for that particular bank is possibility. But that's 66% of the money that, of, uh, that's citizens' money mainly that is going to to uh, out-of-state banks. Or, uh, so none of those five banks that you mentioned probably fared very well on that website. That no. Was, <laughs> they are, they, they're not no. Low. are they on the website? Uh, so when you go to the website, uh, all of our research is there. Okay. Um, so on every Oregon, bank in the state. Oregon Banks Local. Uh, is on OregonBanksLocal.org okay. measured by those four standards I was talking about. Okay. All right. It's, All right. It's, it's, it's <clears throat> I mean, what I would <clears throat> add here is <clears throat> this: what we have is a structural problem, mm-hmm. um, and it's been building for a long time. Um, to go back to the state of North Dakota for just a second, I think what we should aspire to as uh, people interested in a local economy is a system where we have a diversified, broad, uh, localized financial network of mm-hmm. community mm-hmm. banks and credit unions that support the, the, the small oh. businesses and the family farms that okay. are creating the real economy. We should strive towards that. In Oregon, the trend right now is towards greater and greater consolidation. Because okay. as I, like I said, when a bank fails, it doesn't go away. It gets absorbed into a bigger bank. That's it makes right. that bank bigger. It has to be taken over. So that's this, fo- that's this consolidation, this monopoly force that tends to take shape if there's not some countervailing force against that. North Dakota, by contrast, has a much broader base of community banks. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that can be attributed to the role that the Bank of North Dakota has played in their economy um, by supporting local financial institutions um, who otherwise are competing against uh, the sharks in the fish tank. Mm -hmm. Um, They're able to maintain a much more diversified, a much uh, healthier uh, and locally centered economy economic st- structure and that's where we need to be going mm-hmm. um, as long as we kind of buy into the notion that there's no alternative to the way we do things right now we're not going to be moving in the right direction I think what we're hearing in the streets mm-hmm. is that something drastic has to change that that the status quo is not working for mm-hmm. the vast majority, and we need big, big solutions mm-hmm. that take us in different mm-hmm. directions than the ones we're going. And mm-hmm. we need to stop tweaking around the edges. Well, it's beyond it's beyond the need for a band aid, right? And and the word you use, diversity, is, is really important to me because you know a measure of the health of of uh, nat- natural systems is the biodiversity of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they have a lot of different bugs, a lot of different animals, a lot of different trees, and that that measures the health. And uh, on an individual level, uh, the, the the 
uh, advice is always, you know, invest in diversity. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. And so that that seems to me, and I've heard that many, many times, is you just don't put all your money in the stock market or here or there. That's what the, they were always saying to do to these large, <clears throat> like the, the union monies or whatever. You know, diversify mm -hmm. it. And then mm -hmm. what you're saying is, is the same thing. We need to do that here as well. Diversify it and localize it. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, I think the operative metaphor here with the way our money structure right now with that 66% of our wealth going to these mm -hmm. five Wall Street banks is sort of the same as if you spend a dollar at a big box store. It's well documented that that money gets, you know, siphoned out of the sure. community almost immediately through a corporate structure that's designed yeah. to funnel money upward. In Walmart, it goes to Arkansas. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> the same is true with our banking dollars. If we put those dollars into the Wall Street banks, it's, it's, not, you know, any, it's not necessarily malicious. It's just the way they're hardwired. They are hardwired to, to collect our deposits and then meet shareholder demands to maximize the profit on those deposits. And they're answering to shareholders that don't live in the state, might not even live in the country, um, demanding the highest rate of return uh, on those dollars. And that isn't necessarily investing in local businesses here in Oregon, family farms here in Oregon. It might, in fact, be investing in corporate expansion in China to build the factories that will compete with our factories here and put our people out of work. Oh, exactly. yes. That's an exactly. economic system That's a good, important that point. doesn't work for uh, the little guy. And um, I think people are waking up to ways that we can address it in real ways. And we just got to keep building on that. It's you know three years in the making. It didn't all start with the Facebook page, like you said. It didn't all start with a $5 fee. Those may have sparked something new, sure. but it's up to us to keep building on right. those. And frankly, I think from the Working Families Party standpoint, it's incumbent on us to find ways to transition this energy in the streets to uh, holding politicians' feet to the fire on these issues so that they're not two different planes and never the twain shall meet. Um, we have to get the people up here in the halls of mm -hmm. power as <clears throat> concerned about what's going on in the streets as we all are. Mm -hmm. Part of I think, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, that they could be investing in other countries or investing in, in things that doesn't, doesn't do the American worker any good. But I always wonder, you know, uh, a lot of this money that goes to these banks is, is an incredibly exorbitant pay to their CEOs. Sure. And uh, to me, that is part of what really supercharged the atmosphere that allowed such a tiny spark of a $5 fee to just ignite the whole congregation. It just went nuts. Right. And, and to me, that those folks getting that much money, it, it just seems to me it's adding insult to injury. And it's not something that's necessary. I mean, why do they need that much money? Right. When that money could be used locally, it, it just seems a no-brainer. Right. And, and the work that you folks have been doing, you've, you've done the homework that people need to, to, maybe they need to, you know, check up on it, go to Oregon Banks Local, see some of the work that you've done. <clears throat> you meaning the, the, work, the Working Families Party is what's... what's We're part doing. of the effort, yeah. yeah. There's a, several organizations who've been joined in on it, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, uh, organizations people would know um, that have been all involved in this. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's something you're studying as an ongoing thing, probably, too. Absolutely. I mean, we're already talking about sort of the next level of how we analyze um, where our money's going. Um, looking at um, the example of, you know, cities, which cities um, are uh -huh. banking locally and which ones aren't. That's a question that's come up more and more. That's, you know, something that potentially yeah. we could have a real impact on as citizens locally is to get our locally elected officials to move their money. Um, I always say uh, when we, the people at the grassroots, build the parade, the politicians will jump in front of it. <laughs> and you can bet on that. Right now we're building a heck of a parade and we got to keep it moving forward on the local level, mm -hmm. getting um, folks moving at that. I think the city level is really important because I dare say I'm almost positive that, that the, even though Portland may be using community banks, uh, there's probably more people in the 
Portland metropolitan area than there is in the whole state of North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, so that component is pretty important, and maybe you know not not so much Eugene and and Medford, those areas there, but there's an awful large amount of people, and and those are semi-urban areas because they really sprawl large, and uh, that 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 I think, as you mentioned, the next stage, I think that's a very good direction to go in. Mm -hmm. I, I, and are you in touch? Any <clears throat> excuse me, fighting a cold here. <clears throat> Are you in touch with any of the other states that are working towards this goal? And, and Absolutely. We've been talking with the other states. I would say Oregon is um, probably seen as the state that's the furthest along in this process. Um, we've been doing a lot of the research work that the other states are learning from, and mm -hmm. I think we should be proud that uh, Oregon as a state, once again, is uh, creating some innovative uh, new ways of approaching things, for mm -hmm. sure. So that's are, exciting. Are these other states uh, similar to Oregon with a large large uh, or urban and a large rural population, or are they more? Uh, it, it's, all it's all across the board. Across the board? It's, it's states all over the country, <clears throat> from uh, Massachusetts and Maryland to uh, Hawaii is looking at it, uh, California is looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, several states that are sure. in some state of examining this right now. Well, I would think there's a ton of money in Hawaii just, just for their, the taxes they're bringing in, all that exorbitant property. Right. You know, right. So there's a lot of money flowing through there. Well, we're down to about two minutes. <clears throat> it went pretty fast. Any any last questions or comments there, um, Richard? Uh, there's one of your groups in every state? No, we're currently in uh, six states. Oh, okay. But there's okay. um, talk right now uh -huh. about continuing to expand, and um, it's basically a matter of where there's interest, that where there's a will, there's a way, so, and it's just a matter of keep talking to folks that want to do this. And, and you would go on the ballot if you saw it? Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's different in every state. Every All state right. has different oh. laws. I mean, I, let me boil it down this way. Our belief as the Working Families Party is that there is a need to create uh, political power and political organization for working people that is independent of the two-party system okay. that can work okay. within that system when need be, but also work independently uh, when need be. And if there are like-minded people in states around this country, we want to talk to them. And in some cases, we already are um, building this movement. Because like I said, um, there's already plenty of good work going on in the streets. The Working Families Party, um, our contribution to that can be if we can um, bring that energy in the streets and translate it also into real political power that, that people in power both respect and fear, and that gives us a voice in the legislative and the electoral system as well. Okay. It gives us 30 seconds. We I, I want to thank our it. crew. I, I <coughs> thank you. We couldn't do this without them. And we really appreciate the crew coming and Absolutely. helping us. All right. Making this show possible. And I want to thank Steve for coming in. Right. It's, it's been a... Uh, you always make... Complicated things clear. At least clearer. Anyway. <laughs> clearer. That's, right, good. That's, that's good. good. <laughs> that's right. I want to. I want to urge folks out there. You know, maybe you don't want to move your money right away, but you want to check into it. Moving money sometimes is difficult because the people have direct deposits and things. But uh, it's something to think about. Thanks for tuning in.